to you from, from verses 13 to 17 in a moment. And, uh, but we're going to be looking at the second portion of uh, verse 14. I was thinking even as we were just worshiping, I guess uh, part of it is because what made me begin to think about this was uh, the medley that we did of all those old songs that some of you may have learned in children's ministry, right? You know, splash, 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 that thing. You know, because we never knew it. What that was originally was worship songs that, that we sang. We, the Jesus freaks, sang. We didn't do the splash, splash, splash thing because we weren't kids. You know, we were, but we weren't babies and all of that. So as we were listening to that, um, I, I couldn't help but let my mind wander for a moment. And uh, I began to think that this month is my um, month that I celebrate my anniversary of beginning to teach the word. In uh, September, I believe it, yeah, September of 1973, I gave my first Bible study. And so it was, a, you know, just a handful of people, my mom and my dad and a couple of neighbors from the neighborhood and uh, my two sisters, uh, I believe, came to it, just a handful of people. And I remember my mom walking in with a, a tray of, uh, you know, with coffee and with uh, desserts and all. And she had brought it in and was going to serve it to everybody before we had the word, teaching in the word. And, and you gotta, you got to realize I was 23. I had just turned 23 a month before. And uh, there's my mom as the good hostess as she was. And uh, I said, Mom, uh, put that away. Put it on that table over there. I said, we're going to be studying God's word. This isn't a, a time for coffee and donuts. This is the time for the meat of the word. That's what we're going to get into. And, and one of the older men, he was at least 44. <laughs> one of the older men got upset at me. He thought I disrespected my mother, and like it's his business. But anyway, um, but I felt that way from the very first Bible study to the study we're having tonight, 49 years, and that is, no, the word of God is to be honored, respected, reverenced, and obeyed. And that's why I love teaching the word, because I have a group of people who understand that. It's a blessing. And so to be able to, yeah, to be for yourselves, that's good. And <laughs> Well, what a joy it is to, to be able to do this. And so we're here in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read beginning at verse 13. I'll read to verse 17 just to uh, take all the verses in. But I'm going to be looking especially at the second part of verse 14. So Ephesians 6 beginning at verse 13. Paul said, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take in the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so we're beginning and continuing our series found here in Ephesians chapter 6 on spiritual warfare. And tonight, we're going to be looking at the second portion of verse 14, where he said, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. And then he went on to say, Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, let me give you a reminder for a moment as we approach our study. Paul has already stated that every Christian is presently in combat. You see, we belong to God, and because we, we do, we are subject now to spiritual attack. Paul has already identified our enemy. It is Satan and his hosts. He had said that in verse 12 when he said, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so he's already spoken to us concerning that. He's identified our enemy as Satan and his hosts. And because we're in combat with spiritual forces, he's made it clear, and we're looking at this, that our weapons are spiritual. The weapons of our warfare, he says, are to be mighty in God. Now, when he wrote to the Corinthians, he spoke about spiritual warfare. 
in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. He said, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. So though we continue living in this world, our weapons are not physical weapons. Our battle is against spiritual passions and spiritual enemies that seek to destroy. We are not trying to conquer and enslave men through physical combat. Our weapons are spiritual, and we achieve victory by the power of truth. Our victories come through the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus conquered, and because he did, through him, our victory is guaranteed. We know the final outcome, but we also know that battles continue. So with this in mind, we stand prepared for combat. In Romans 13, verse 12, and I'm reading out of what is called the Amplified, Amplified Version. In Romans 13, 12, the night, this present evil age, is almost gone, and the day of Christ's return is almost here. So let us fling away the works of darkness and put on the full armor of light. So we've closely examined the first article of our armor, the girdle of truth. <laughs> I'm sorry, John. Every t I'm sorry, man. I see you. I can't help but see you. I tease John a lot. You guys have already picked up on that. I fire him, rehire him just because I love to tease him. So we talked about the belt. The girdle is the belt. It, and and uh, as I was going through this with you last time, let me review this, review this for a minute. I mentioned that a soldier needs to have the mind to fight. In other words, the proper way to enter a battle is being fully prepared and determined. We, we enter into battle, but we fight from the position of faith. And we also fight with an assurance of victory. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13, Paul said it like this. He said, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, and be strong. That's the attitude of a warrior. Now, there are times when it seems that everything is stacked up, stacked up against us. There really isn't any way that we're going to win this battle. I was reading and remembering about the children of Israel as they were about to enter into Canaan, the, the land of promise. And there were 12 spies that had been sent to examine the land and to bring back a description of this land of promise that had been given to the children of Israel. Well, they went in, as we know, and each one of those men, one from each tribe of Israel, 12 men, they went in, they saw the inhabitants, they saw the richness of the land, and after 40 days they returned. And they came back with this report. They said the land flowed with milk and honey. The fruit of the land, they said, is rich. But the problem is there are people inhabiting that land that we're supposed to take that are invincible. Now, one of the spies, a man by the name of Caleb, said, let's go at once and take possession of it. Well, Numbers 13, verses 31 through 33 says, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack these people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said the land uh, we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak came from the Nephilim. They were giants. We seemed like grasshoppers. Notice, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So that's the report that was brought back. Caleb says, <laughs> God says it's ours. Let's take it. The other said, no. No, it's beautiful. That's right. It's great, no doubt. But there are giants there. They are invincible, and they inhabit certain portions. There's no way we can do that. And so what happened? Well, the people of Israel listened to the fears of the ten spies, and what they did is they were provoked to fear and to weep. They even wanted to get rid of Moses. They wanted a new leader to take them home. So when Moses and Aaron reasoned with them, their response is they wanted to stone them. 
The result, as we know in scripture, was that the people wandered the wilderness for 40 years. Only Caleb and Joshua, as well as those under 20, eventually entered in. Now, 45 years later, at the age of 85, Caleb entered the land. In Joshua chapter 14, verse 12, this is what he said. Give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day. For you heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord has said. Now that's a bad old man. 85, a man of faith. He said, God promised it. I wandered here with these others for 40 plus years. It's been a long time, but I'm ready to take this. I'm ready to do it. So Joshua blessed him. He went and he took the city of giants. So when we put on the belt of truth, our minds are to be settled like Caleb's. Settled on certain victory. If God has said it, it will be done. The enemy uses lies to bring discouragement, and he causes us to lose hope. So Jesus is truth. His word is true, so we hold fast to him and his word. What do we do? When we spend time in prayer, we spend time in the word, we get serious about the things of the Lord, we present ourselves to God, and we go into battle. And so as we're looking at this, we've girded ourselves with truth, but now we have another piece that we're looking at, the breastplate of righteousness. Now, next time we get together, I'm going to have a, a picture so you can see the Roman armor, and I can kind of point these things to you. Should have done it this time, but I will next time. So the breastplate covered from the throat down to the thighs. It was to protect the soldier's heart and lungs and the abdominal cavity. It was made up of two parts. It protected the body on both sides. Now, why would Paul speak about putting on the breastplate of righteousness? Well, I want to develop this with you. The breastplate protected the internal organs. In, uh, in Scripture, in the Old Testament especially, you see it in the New also, very often the word bowels are used to speak of, of certain things, the inner, inner organs, the internal organs. You see, to Jews, this represented the will, the emotions, it represented the bowels, it represented desires and conscience, the mind. So in Job 30, verse 27, he said, my bowels, speaking of my intestines, internal organs, my inward parts, my bowels boiled, churned, and rested not. The days of affliction confronted me. It speaks about his emotions and desires. In the Old Testament book of Lamentations, chapter 2, verse 11, my eyes do fail with tears, my bowels are troubled, my liver is poured upon the earth. Deuteronomy 6, verse 6, these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. This speaks of internal things, and that's the point. Our lives are protected by understanding our standing before God. And my standing before God is not based on how I feel. My standing is informed by his word. So my emotions are under the control of my will. Because how many times have you felt that you weren't saved, even though you know you gave your heart to Christ? Because our heart very often will, will, will convict us and condemn us. We'll look at that in a moment. And so I want to build this for you. I'm going to develop this a little bit further. We have been made righteous through faith in Christ. Now, the word righteous, we use that word a lot. It was a word when I was growing up that we use quite often, we would say, man, that's righteous. You know, that's what we said. And so, uh, there was a group called the Righteous Brothers, you know, and uh, all of that. And they played and they sang, they were righteous. But anyway, the word righteous means morally upright. It speaks of the condition that is acceptable to God. When you speak of righteous in scripture, it speaks of integrity. It speaks of virtue and purity. It speaks of being right. Now, Paul had in verse 11 instructed us to put on the whole armor of God. So how do we put on the breastplate of righteousness? Well, we do so by recognizing that God has provided his righteousness for us. We first recognize and are aware of the spiritual atmosphere we live in. Paul spoke of this in chapter 2, verse 3. He said, we meandered according to the course of this age. So that led us to establishing false standards of rightness before God. Paul had stated that Israel was very guilty of this. Mankind still is. Mankind has a tendency 
of making up rules, regulations, or religions that are based on their efforts to be right with God. Every, in the core of every religion on the face of the earth, outside of Christianity, you find within its core man's effort. Man's effort through fasting, man's effort through prayer, man's effort through doing good things. It's man's effort. I've been to various places on the face of the earth. I've been to India. I've been to China. I've been to places where there's, there, are, there are heavy uh, influences. Japan, the Shinto religion, the Buddhist religion, the Hindu religion. Uh, I've been into Jordan where the Muslim, I, we've been around. We've seen it. And the core of these religious faiths, every one of them is man's effort. Every one, every one as man in the center doing his best to become acceptable to God. Every one of those religious systems. Man always establishes works to become right with God. In Romans 10, verse 3, Paul said that they, that they did not know the righteousness that comes from God, and so they sought to establish their own. So in establishing our own standards, what we do is we actually lower the bar. We do it by fashioning a God in our own image, and reject the holiness of God. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 16, Paul said, God alone is immortal, and he lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Job 37, 23 says, The Almighty is beyond our reach. He's exalted in power. Psalm 18, verse 30 this God, his way is perfect. His way is innocent and complete. His way is sound. I was uh, in an airport, and I saw somebody approaching people who were seated there waiting for their, their flights. And uh, eventually, I could see you speaking to them about something. And I began to wonder, what is it? What is he? What is he selling? What is he doing? And so I waited, and he finally approached me, and he walks up to me, and he says to me something like, um, "I have a book here that has the words of Almighty God that I would like to give to you, or sell to you. You're selling it. It is called the Bhagavad Gita." And I said, "Really?" And he goes, yeah, I said, I said, I already have a book that gives me the words of God. And I pulled out my pocket Bible, my switchblade. <laughs> and I held it to him. And I said, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And I began to preach the gospel to this guy. And he got up tight. Why? B because he wasn't expecting to go to church, right? He wasn't expecting to get a Bible study. He, was, he just wanted to sell his book. But I said, I already have this book. See, God's word is the words of eternal life. And so who do we go? Where would we go, right? And we need to understand that. That's the whole thing. It is, uh, there are a lot of Christians who are confused over this one thing. They say there are so many religions. No, there are, there are two. There is God's religion and there's Satan's. And Satan's comes in various ways. It has various masks that it wears. But it's all the same. It's man's effort to somehow appease and get right with a holy God or to become perfect in your own strength. But the Bible consistently teaches us that God is righteous. In Habakkuk, the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 13, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. Remember Jesus in John 17, 25 said, O righteous Father, the world has not known you. So he's our righteous father, but he is also our righteous judge. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now, he is the righteous father, but he's the righteous judge. And as a righteous judge, his justice concerning sin is fair and impartial. So when you read your Bible, you see concerning sin that God declares all mankind to be guilty of it. Ecclesiastes 7.20, there's not a righteous man on earth who does what is right and never sins. 
Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the Bible condemns all under sin. And so what happens is because God is holy and we are not, our sin makes separation between us and our God. Isaiah, the prophet, chapter 59, verses 1 and 2 said it like this. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So God has stated that there's a proper penalty for this sin, death. In Ezekiel 18, verse 4, behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the father, so also the soul of the son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. And then the scripture says it is appointed unto men to die once and after this, what? The judgment. And so this is where we're at. And yet, the Bible also reveals that God loves the world and desires to save people. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises. Some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Everyone, that, that's us. That's every person on the face of the earth. 1 Timothy 2, 4 says that God wants all men to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. Sin made a separation, but God loves and desires fellowship with us for some reason. So how can he make a sinner not guilty? And how can he restore the sinner to fellowship with him? You look in the Garden of Eden and you see that when Adam partook of that forbidden fruit, whatever it was, that he had a sense of who he was. So when the Lord approached him, Adam said, I knew that I was naked and I hid myself from you. The first time man tried to fashion some kind of garment that protected him or hid him was a result of sin. So what can God do? He desires us. And yet he's a righteous judge. Well, one, he can condemn people outright. Or two, he can compromise his righteousness and receive them just as they are. Or three, he can change them into righteous people. And God chose the third option. God chose to make the unrighteous righteous. That's called the doctrine of justification, making and declaring the unrighteous righteous. So that answers an ancient question that was asked by Job. In Job 25, 4, how then can a man be righteous before God? How can one born of woman be pure? What is the answer? Through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on our behalf. In 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That speaks of what is called imputed righteousness. He gives to us what we did not have. We were sinners, lost, moving towards judgment and eternal separation in hell. But God so loved the world that he sends his son Jesus, who takes upon himself our sin as the sacrifice on our behalf as the Lamb of God. And in doing so, I trust in what he has done in his finished work. And he gives to me that which I didn't have. I give, in, in, in a sense, my dirtiness is removed and his righteousness is applied. So some attempt to make themselves righteous by their own efforts. The Bible reveals that good works are not sufficient for this. Isaiah 64, 6 says it like this. We are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Our righteousness is like the filthy leper's rag. So a leper's skin that is oozing, they would wrap it in order to, to kind of just, you know, what you would do just to wrap it. But because it was oozing, it would become filthy. It, you know, dust and everything, it, it was filthy. And he says, our righteousness is like a leper's rag. No matter how good you think you are, he was saying, you're like filth in the sight of this pure God. So how do I get right with God? All of this is working towards us looking at the, the, uh, that piece of uh, weaponry, by the way. How do we become acceptable to God by trusting in Jesus? 
In Romans 5, 17, if by the trespass of the one man, Adam, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Again, when we receive Christ, we receive his righteousness. So God gives to us his righteousness when we trust Jesus. Psalm 24, 5, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. James 2, 23, Abraham believed God. It was imputed unto him for righteousness. And so, by faith, we put on the breastplate of righteousness. Again, the breastplate is intended to protect you from the feelings of wretchedness that you can feel. These feelings can be a combination of emotions and the enemy's attack. We condemn ourselves because we fail to be what we really would like to be. I remember when I first got saved, uh, for me, the, the elation was unbelievable. I, I was still young. There was, you know, God was merciful to save me at the age of 20. I was still young. But I felt like I had sinned so much for so long. And, and, and in many ways, I, I had. And, and I had, I, it, within me, I had this, this terrible guilt. I, I remember just this, how bad I was. I was in every way, um, I was a disappointment to my parents. I was ashamed to my father. I just was not a good person. And, and though I had a hard exterior, I still remember that inside I when I was honest even with myself I I knew there was something wrong with me I knew that and I was getting in a lot of trouble when I was 18 19 20 I got into into I, I started stealing a lot more I started doing a lot of drinking doing a lot of drugs I lost uh, about 30 pounds in a month because I was loaded or drunk every day and I stopped eating and I was already not that big. I only weighed 175 pounds, but I went down to 145. I just wasn't eating and I was drinking and smoking pot and every night and, and, and I was getting, and then I was doing crazy things and, and my parents didn't know what to do with me. And then I was just, I was not good to people and I was, I was that guy that if you and I were drinking together and you got up and walked away and you left your drink, that's mine. You know, that was me. You know, you left something out. If I needed it, it became mine. I was just not a good person. And I started feeling that sense of guilt. And then see my mom crying and my father so disappointed and my brother so angry and my sisters so fearful of where I was going and what I was doing. Seeing all of that, and then when I almost died, when I, I overdosed, I almost died of an overdose of, of wine and, and uh, second all, barbiturates, reds. And I still remember waking up saying to myself and then actually starting to pray, God, you got to do something for me. I am so messed up. I don't know how to be a son. I don't know how to be a boyfriend. I don't know how to be a brother. I don't know how to be anything. You got to help me. I still remember that. Some of you know your own testimony the same as mine. You know your, your testimony. God, help me. Something is wrong with me. My dad took me to a psychiatrist to try and get me, to, you know, talked out of my crazy. None of that worked. I was a liar. I was a habitual liar and a thief. So God made me a pastor. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. That's what I was. I was a liar and a thief and a doper. And uh, so I get saved. And the elation, that, that joy it, it is almost physical where I almost could say I've, it's like I felt a stone rolling off of my shoulders, a heavy stone that was gone. And I, that, that, that's why when I went home and I told my sister, sisters, I gave my heart to Christ and I, and I told my parents, I love you, and, you know, that was so radically different than what I was. But about three weeks later, the enemy reminded me of some things. And the enemy will do that. You know that, don't you? He will remind you of some things. 
First John 3.20, he actually doesn't need help, by the way. First John 3.20 says, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. He knows all things. Romans 8.1, I memorized this when I was a very young Christian. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. No condemnation, right? That's what God does. So if you're saved, you are righteous through faith in Christ. And you rest in not your feelings, but God's declarations. In Philippians 3, 8, and 9, Paul said it like this. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. So put on the breastplate of righteousness. We now are living a righteous life because we have put on Christ who is righteous and we live a righteous life. It speaks of our conduct. It speaks of our character. It speaks of us being brand new in Jesus. We're completely forgiven. We've been made right with God. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If you're in Christ, it's, it's all done. It's finished. It's washed away. That is, wow, that's good news. That, that, it, it's, it's, it's so amazing. Micah 7, 19 says he will again have compassion on us. We'll subdue our iniquities. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 Paul said, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. He goes on to say, and such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. You see, Satan loves to work in conjunction with our flesh. He likes to remind us of what we were. And it happens. And it can happen frequently, especially when you first get saved. I still remember my brother saying to me, David, I. I know what you are. You've been a con all your life, and you're still a con now. You're using Jesus, but you're a con. And uh, I said, no, Frank, I, I, I've, I've become right with God. No, no, no. I've seen you go through so many fads, and this is just one of them. How long is it going to be until you go back to what you've been? Well, I never have. But what happened is I went into the Army. I spent my two years. I got out, started a Bible study. My mom and my dad attended it. I taught that study for a year in Norwalk. My brother in August, August 4th, got saved. And I watched him. He was living here in Ontario. I was living in Norwalk. And my brother got saved, but he wasn't going to church. And so I started being concerned for him. And so what I did is I started driving from Norwalk with my sister Madeline, and I would drive from Norwalk to Ontario, and I would teach him the Word of God every Monday, every Monday. I started going September, October, and then he invited friends, and then he invited one of his coworkers that that uh, he loved a lot and wanted her to be there. And that's how I met my girl who became my wife. She came to the Bible study and she sat under our, my, my ministry from, from the day she got saved until this day. And so Frankie waited for me to go back. I never did because I wasn't the dog that was returning to the vomit. I wasn't the pig that was returning to the, the mud that had been washed from. But the enemy will remind you. He can do so through friends. He can do so through family. 
He can do so through your inclinations in some areas that you know you're weak and you feel guilty because you felt a, a draw. And I'll tell you, he never sleeps. And I'll tell you that some of those inclinations you're not even aware of. Years ago now, it's been a good 35 years at least, my dad calls me up. He, my dad had moved out into this area. He called me up. He said, Dave, I've got something at the house that I would like you to tell me if it's what I think it is. And I said, okay, Dad, I'm on my way to the church office, and I came. I stopped at his house, and he has his shopping bag. And it wasn't his luggage. It was something else because Mexican luggage is shopping bags. But anyway, <laughs> he, in matching pair. I have a story about that I could tell you. But, but he gives me the shopping bag. And he says, do you know what this is? And I'll never forget, I, I opened the bag and, I, and the smell wafted into my face. It was a kilo of marijuana that somebody had dropped on his property. Somebody had dropped it on his property by, by one of the fences. And I opened it up, and that marijuana just... Now, my favorite drug was pot. That was my favorite drug. That was the drug of choice. I started my days, two joints wrapped up in, behind my ear, smoking one. That's how I would start my day. I loved smoking pot. And now my dad's handed me a kilo... And I was pastoring this church. And so I still, it's almost like, you know, those cartoons with the smoke in the hand that goes. It, 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 it felt like that. I go, whoa, this is heavy. I rolled it up. And I said, you know, we got to burn this, Dad, one stick at a time. No, I said. <laughs> Just to make sure it's all gone. I brought it to the church office, and one of the guys on staff was also a chaplain for the uh, Chino PD, and I handed it to him. I said, get rid of this stuff. See, there are, the, the enemy knows your, 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 your spot. He knows that. You're, you're lonely, right? And, uh, and um, now that you're saved, you don't have any dates. It's funny, you get saved, and suddenly all these people begin to call up, hey, what are you doing? You want to go out? And you're thinking, you weren't doing that before. Why are you doing that now? He's very, he's very that way. You've seen, many of you see that. You know what I'm talking about. I'm speaking to people who know that. That's what happened to me. Things like that. He wants to draw you back. And then if you have any sense that oh, now you're feeling guilty, your heart begins to condemn you. Man, I thought this was all dead. But you know what? The old man is still attempting to dominate. I have to reckon myself to be dead. I have to understand in Christ I am dead. But that's when you put on this, this breastplate. That's when you awaken and say, wait a minute, my heart is condemning me, but God is greater than my heart. He knows all things. He knows I have, I, 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 he knows what my weakness is, but at the same time, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so what happens is in the spiritual battle, the enemy is going to bring to your attention things that were your weaknesses and make you promises, as he always has, that if you only do this and return to that, you're going to be happy. You'll be so happy if you go back. But that's not what happens, is it? Because if you fail, then you wake up one morning and you say, how did I get here? And the way I got there is I wasn't wearing my armor. I wasn't aware of who I am. Listen, this, the, the, the mental part of, and I'll use that term, of, of warfare is you need to know who you are. You need to know that, who you are. Who are you? You are a child of God. You are born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. You are brand new in Christ. Old things have passed away. That's who you are. You are in Christ Jesus, and you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is your armor. The things that we see in the armor are really attributes of Christ himself, and that has been put on you. And so you can do all things. You can have victory. You can, but you need to wear your armor. And the problem, a, lot, a lot of the problem is is. We fail to remember that. We don't put on our vest. We don't put on that when the, the enemy is firing his, his darts at us. And so the enemy loves to work in conjunction with your flesh. He reminds you of what you were. He makes sure that you are aware of your unworthiness. Not in 
not in the proper way, because I, I truly believe that every one of us, if we think in a proper way, we will know that we really are not worthy. No, I am not worthy of the love of Christ. I'm not. There's nothing about me or about any of us that should make him drawn. He has been drawn by his own love. He, he loves us for his own for his own reasons. He loves us for his own reasons. And there's nothing I can do to make myself something that he'd love. Nothing. He just does. That's where humility comes in. I'm so unworthy. You are. You are unworthy. Yes, you are. Of course you are. But I have chosen to love you. And when you finally awaken to that, my God loves me, your life is different. And he's given me his righteousness. It's not works of righteousness, which I have done, but he's actually imputed his to me so that when God looks at me, he sees me through the lens of Christ. He sees the blood that has washed me and cleansed me. See, this, that's called Christianity. A lot of people don't understand that. What they think is still to this day, even calling themselves Christians, that they have to do a lot of things to make themselves presentable to God. But you know, what you do is you present yourself to God, and God cleanses you by the blood of Christ. And then you're in the position to be used by the Lord. And so you say, like Isaiah, here am I, Lord. Send me. Use me. Lord, I'm, I'm on your team, and I don't want to sit on the bench holding my glove wishing I could be in the game. I want to get my uniform dirty. I want to play. I want to rock. I want to do something for Christ. I don't want to be a bench warmer. I want to be on the team. I want to play. I want to see you do something fantastic. And, Lord, you can use anybody. You use a donkey to speak to Balaam. You can use me to speak to somebody. So, Lord, please. And the Lord says, I, I will. I intend to. You're in a battle. I've given you truth. And you've put on that breastplate. You're righteous. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind because the enemy will say, you're filthy. You're a liar. Those I was. I was. Some of you were, he said to the Corinthians, but not now. You're washed and sanctified. You're justified in Jesus Christ. You are brand new. That's, I'm, I really hope that that makes some sense to you. Listen, Jesus is the friend of sinners, and he's a friend of sinners who have asked for mercy. He's not our enemy. In Isaiah 53, verse 5, it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. Somebody once said, when Satan reminds you of your past, Remind him of his future. You see, with the breastplate in place, we are no longer controlled by emotions. I spoke to my friend, George. I was a Christian for three weeks, and I told him, I just don't feel saved. I had such an elated feeling when I got saved, but George, I don't know if I'm saved because I don't have that same feeling. And I was three weeks old in Jesus when my friend George said, it's never based on your emotions. It's based on God's declarations. God has said, not guilty. You are not guilty. You're brand new in Jesus Christ. So you put that on. You put on God's righteousness that you have through Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 8, it says, Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. So we can live victoriously, and we can be filled with joy because we are brand new in him. Brand new. Isn't it a, a, isn't it a joy when people you knew from your past and you haven't seen for a while, you've gotten saved and then they see you somewhere and they, they try to go back to where you used to be and then you say, hey, that's not me anymore? I love that, man. I've had in this church more than once, more than once, in an Easter service, I gave an Easter service, 
and somebody walks up to me afterwards and tells me, you know, so-and-so who went to high school with you was here today. I said, really? And they said, I know that guy. He's a liar and he's a con. And they left the church service because they couldn't believe that you had changed that much. And I said, well, tell Marie not to do that in public. It's, <laughs> it's very, very embarrassing. I had a guy, I have a guy, hopefully I'll be seeing him this week. I went to high school with him when we were 14, 14. I've known him since 14. And so, did I say 14? I've known him for a long time, <laughs> 14. Um, he was in our church a year. And his wife finally wrote me and said, may I ask you, did you go to Sierra High School? in such and so dates, and I saw her last name, and I only knew one person by that name, and that was my buddy in high school. So I looked at her page, and it says she was married to Art, this friend of mine. So I wrote, and I said, hey, say hi to Art for me. She writes, she says, it is you. She says, we've been in your church for a year, but Art says that cannot possibly be the David I hung around with. True story. I'll be seeing him this Friday. Isn't it great when the Holy Spirit changes your life like that? And it's not, and it's not because you outgrew sin. See, that's the whole thing. Oh, you outgrow it. I had a buddy named Eddie. He says, oh, yeah, I used to do that. I outgrew it. You don't outgrow sin. What you do is you get better at it. And if you practice it long enough, if you lie long enough, if you steal long enough, you can be president. That's what happens. <laughs> you get good at it. <laughs> so you never outgrow it, right? You never do. You turn from it. You put on the breastplate of righteousness. You know who you are because of Jesus Christ, what he has done, because his truth has set us free. So the first thing we have is the girdle of truth. His truth has set me free, and he's made me righteous. And when the enemy comes after me, all I have to do is ask my Lord and Savior to be there for me and to work within me. Philippians 4, 7 says, The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So when Satan knocks on your door to bother you, ask Jesus to answer the door. And you do this through Scripture. You do this through understanding who you are in him. And you do this by putting on the breastplate of righteousness. You have been made righteous before God. You are looked at by God as having the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's who you are. And so what we do is we live as if we understand that. May our lives be righteous. May people look at us and say, there's something different about you. I've known a lot of Christians before, but there's something different about you. What is it? I don't know what you're seeing that's any different about anybody else. All I know is this. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I am serious about my faith in him. And I've had so many opportunities, not as a pastor only, but just as a person to be that influence to people, working with them, talking to them. Even people we bought our first house from, you know, they, were there, they said, I've never been around people like you before. People have, and this, the sales lady came to the church, you know, and to, to check. I'll give one more story and then I'll close. <laughs> just, it just, I used to go to a particular restaurant to have coffee every Tuesday with one of my staff members. Every Tuesday, I would leave the church campus and have meetings at a coffee shop. And so we would drink coffee and we'd go through church business for a couple hours. So the waitress became very friendly to us because we were there every week. And so finally she walks up and, you know, she's nice and we're friendly and all of that. And she says to me, finally, she says, I have a joke I want to tell you. And I look at her and I go, all right. And so she tells me this dirty joke and I just kind of look at her and smile. And she goes, oh, guess it wasn't that funny. And then she says, you're here every Tuesday. She goes, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor. And she turns to the table next to me and she goes, oh, my goodness, I just told a dirty joke to a pastor. She yelled that out. And so, you know, now that was funnier than her dirty joke. But you know what happened? 
I told her where, where we were. She came to church. She answered an invitation to come to faith in Christ. And so those are the things you see. Those are the things you see. Just let your light shine. Know who you are. And be aware that you're in combat. Know that the enemy attacks your mind. We'll be looking at this in more detail. Your heart also joins forces with him. So you feel like the wretch that you were prior to coming to Christ. But then God says, no, I have made you righteous. I have given you my righteousness. And you, Lord, that I'm going to need to make sure that that breastplate is on constantly, guarding my emotions, because I fall prey to depression and sorrow of heart because of what I've been. And God says, no, I buried that in the deepest part of the sea. I put a no fishing sign there. It isn't going to be brought up. Your sins are forgiven. Now walk in the newness of Christ. If you can do that daily, watch what God will do. So we'll look at some more of this as we go through this next time we get together. Father, we just thank you so much for the simple.